Hello and welcome back to Reality Check. Well, for some time I've been hearing stories about how our intelligence community remains, despite its protests, very interested in the subject of psionics, psychics, and the phenomena that I think a lot of debunkers dismiss pejoratively as a load of piffle and nonsense. Well, today I'm very honoured to be able to welcome to Reality Check a woman who is an extraordinarily accomplished woman, Sarah Gam, worked on the UAP task force officially for about a year with the Pentagon in the Department of Defence, and then unofficially for a lot longer before Arrow took over. And I've seen her speaking elsewhere, and I think her story is fascinating. I really admire her willingness to engage candidly about the fact that she believes she has certain gifts, psychic abilities, mediumship abilities. And yet at the same time, she's an accomplished scientist, trained scientist and intelligence analyst working in different times at very high levels of the US intelligence community. So we're talking again this week through our sponsor about the horrors of what happens to your body when you eat the ultra processed food that passes for grub in America. And it turns out the key to losing weight and keeping it off is not in carbs or fat or even in probiotic rich foods. No, the end game of having a healthy weight as much as well as more energy and a long healthy life comes down to a specific switch you can flip in your body to flush out unnecessary calories. Dr. C. Stephen Gundry is calling this caloric bypass. And by activating this specific process in your body, he has seen thousands, yes, thousands of people dramatically improve their health, even at age 50 and beyond. This includes losing weight, getting tons more energy, and returning to the good health they had in their youth once they simply addressed this one key to better health. And not only is this associated with improved digestion, strong feeling joints and muscles, smoother skin and healthier lives, it could also be the key to a healthier life. Dr. Stephen Gundry's lost 70 pounds himself using his research and has kept the weight off for over 20 years and counting. His digestive issues are gone, his health is fantastic, and he feels younger and healthier today than he did in his 40s. His video has been watched by over 20 million people to date, and you can watch and learn more about it at thehealthyfat.com slash Ross. I'll say that again, the healthyfat.com slash Ross. It's linked at the bottom of this video, but he'll teach you exactly how he's kept his weight off for free at thehealthyfat.com slash Ross. And you can click in the description below. It's a privilege to have her with us here today. And Sarah, I'd like to welcome you to Reality Check. Hi, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. And I appreciate that intro. So tell me this, Sarah, you worked on the UAP task force. What years were you there? I started officially in 2019 through, uh, I forget, somewhere later in 2020, whenever I left NGA and National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and went to ODNI, Office of Director of Natural Intelligence. Um, so that was my official stint on it. And then the unofficial stint was uh, I kept on supporting Supporting from from behind the door a little bit. Now, you'll know that I interviewed Dave Grush, of course, last year. And of course, he came from the NGIA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. I don't suppose you guys shared a desk or were in the same coffee room by any chance, were you? Did you know no. him there? No, we weren't even in the same time zone. I know he uh, also supported from NRO perspective and some of the NRO colleagues knew him, but um, we were not in the same time zone, so we never got to, to share coffee or meet. So you'd never even heard about each other, and uh, even though you were working on the UAPTF at the time? Um, I, I did not. I did not know him. Well, I was supporting the task force from a very small niche, from a small corner from NGA. So we kind of were kept in our own bucket and didn't really participate. in. Um, he sounded sounds like he participated in a lot broader perspective. And I was very um, 
yeah, very fine tuned perspective from imagery aspect. Now, I'm sure you're tied up like most people with ridiculously long, top secret SCI compartmented clearances that restrict you from talking about much relating to your job. And we will respect that. We're not inviting you to discuss things that are national security sensitive. But can you give us an idea? What did the UAPTF do? Like, what was the role of the UAPTF? Because I think for a lot of us, it comes as a huge surprise to know that even while the, the, um, public debate was going on about whether or not UAPs were being taken seriously. All this time, there was a unit inside the Pentagon, even before Arrow, the all-domain anomaly resolution office, that was indeed investigating UFOs, UAPs. Yeah, what I, my perspective of the task force was either trying to prove something was unidentified and unidentified aerial phenomenon or anomalous phenomenon, whichever term you want to use, um, that didn't mean it was non-human intelligence. It just meant we couldn't identify it. So that's what our definition was. And so we proved or disproved. It was a very collaborative effort. It was pretty amazing for how many uh, different agencies and people, um, at least from NGA perspective, no one was really turned away who wanted to support it. It was really diverse and um, kind of like kind uh, what yeah open open arms type thing of collaboration. So uh, yeah, we we all work together to try to prove or disprove data that came in. Let's skirt around your TSSCI clearances and see how close we can get to get you to pry out some right. dark secrets. So Definitely no promises. I don't want to go to jail tonight or <laughs> any time in the near future. Did you see videos that the public hasn't seen yet that made you realize just how real the phenomenon is? Oh, absolutely. Um, this question is actually getting easier and easier to answer. The first time I answered it, uh, it, I paused quite a long time, um, and now it's it's getting easier because I know the stigma, and people want to hear this, and these words help. So yes, definitely, there's a lot more out there, and some of it, you know, unfortunately classified that can't be released to the public. Um, but no doubt in my mind that we're not alone. So when you say we're not alone, you believe that we are, Earth is being visited, or at least there are non-human intelligences engaging with this planet. Yes, absolutely. Wow. That is what I'm saying. Can you tell us what the smoking gun was? What was the aha moment for you when you realized having access and being privy to this information within the constraints of what you're allowed to tell us? What was that moment like? What, what happened? What did you see and how did it move you? Yeah, I think it was a buildup of multiple things. Uh, so one of the first videos where a handful of us really didn't know what it was, and we were talking to other intelligence community agencies and you know people with the clearance, right? Um, it was at first like, mm, I don't know, because my science brain is very active and skeptic. Uh, my... Also, but my science brain knows we're not alone because I, you know, I'm an astrophysicist as well. So how could we be the only people in infinite amount of space? It just makes no sense. So I was definitely a skeptic. The first couple of things that I saw, think, like discounted it as, um, you know, that was just a couple of pixels. It was blurry. And then slowly over time, more and more things accumulated. And then there was... Um, just a couple of incidences where some videos were a little bit clearer or some, some images were a little bit clearer than others. And it's just, your breath kind of stopped like that. That's, there's no way that could have been a balloon or parallax because parallax is of course very prevalent in a lot of the cases. <laughs> yeah. So tell me this, one of the excuses or reasons that's often given for why this kind of t uh, video data cannot be released is because to reveal it would reveal sources and methods. 
Now, is that a legitimate reason for excluding all of the imagery you saw? I, I can imagine there might be some satellites, for example, that we don't want the potential adversaries to know just how clever we are with those satellites. I talk to people here in Australia who shock me with how clear the satellite imagery is that comes down through Pine Gap all the way back to the US. But um, do you think that it's legitimate that all of the imagery has been withheld? Or do you think that there is a public interest in seeing perhaps at least some, if not all, of that imagery? Yeah, um, very good question. I will say, I don't want to give a percentage, but I'll say a good portion of what I saw, I don't think should be released because it is protecting sensitive and maybe, you know, people on the ground. And, um, but yeah, I don't see why some of, you know, what we were able to observe, even the ones that were proven to be balloons or something to give examples of what we've been looking at, that this is science. We're not just saying every video that comes across our path, including just stuff that's posted on YouTube, right? So we're looking at all the data, not just classified. And to give examples of parallax or um, yeah, balloons or bird migration, bird mi I've, I've learned about birds during this time, um, uh, or you know, fishing boat formations and all kinds of stuff that um, you, you might not really think, but you end up learning <laughs> You learn so much more than than what you think just going down these rabbit holes. Um, yeah, so I I could see uh, some of them definitely being declassified. I am by far in no position to be an authority or anything like that. So I'm just going to stay hopeful that one day, you know, maybe me, my words speaking right now might help uh, nudge somebody to be able to disclose some stuff. What do you think, and I'm not trying to get you into trouble, so you are welcome to deflect this question if you want to. I appreciate but, that. <laughs> but but what, what do you think of the explanation that has been offered by the Pentagon in recent times that there is no evidence at all of extraterrestrial visitation to this planet? Um, I don't know what they looked at to say that. I don't understand why they would um, when there's a lot of us saying that we've seen otherwise. And uh, yeah, it kind of hurts because a lot of us worked really hard on some data and debunking or proving or, you know, whatever. It was, it was a lot of hard work that went into some of the videos that I saw and for them to come out saying that right now, it's, it's, it's a, it hits, hits you a little hard. One of the things you've used a couple of times is the term parallax. Now, I, I know what parallax is, and I'll try and explain it, but if you could correct me, I'm sure I'm going to screw it up. As I understand it, parallax is describing the phenomenon where an object looks further away from the camera than it really is, and as a result of that, it's basically moving far faster to the viewer looking at the image than it really is. And so the, you get this false image of an object moving super, super fast, when in fact it's actually moving quite slowly because it's closer to the camera than we realize. Is that a fair description? Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, I would, um, the only thing I would add on from just trying to give a, I'm, I'm a visual person. So if you're looking out, like if you're a pilot in an airplane looking out over the horizon, it's really hard to judge distance. Um, so if you're looking at a drone video and something's flying by, um, maybe the drone video also is panning across the scene. Um, so that will make the object look faster as well, or maybe it might look stagnant. Um, so it's dif difficult to get direction and velocity um, due to parallax. But yeah, you did a great job. So Chris Mellon, who's a former very, very senior defense official, has candidly spoken about his frustration that the Pentagon's not being open about even what it's seeing in outer space. Now, are you able to tell me, did any of the imagery that you see, you saw in your time, come from space-based satellites or objects? Yes. Yeah, there were some that were yeah from space-based satellites looking down. And were they clearer? Well, I mean, I'm told that a lot of the more clear imagery and high-resolution imagery has been shot from um, satellites 
and or the space station and or the space shuttle in its time? Um, I've, yes, I've seen some. Yeah. And similarly, one of the things that has been pointed to me is I'm told that one of the videos that really set off people at the UAP task force was an object that appeared to be operating transmedium, moving in and out of the water. Um, is that Are you able to speak with any reference to that? Was there an object that you saw on video that was alarmingly clear coming in and out of water? I have seen data that shows that. I can't get into much detail about it, um, but... Uh, you know, some of the legacy videos that have that, you know, the public sees, you know, I never spent time really diving into them because people already did that. Taxpayer dollars have already gone into that. So I have seen other videos that are of what you just described. So Lou Elizondo uh, has at different times acknowledged that he has seen videos in the public domain that are still the subject of speculation as to whether or not they're authentic, which are he believes, genuine videos because he saw them during his time when he was operating in a classified role. Uh, ha have you had that experience yourself? Are there videos that you've seen that you believe are genuine that are still being debated in the public arena? Um, yeah, I actually appreciate that question a lot. There are some things that have been leaked and I want to say what has been unfortunately leaked, which is what we call an unauthorized disclosure, uh, isn't the whole picture. So some things that have been in media uh, is a 5% of what it is. And I can't talk about more of what it truly was, but I will say, I hope people stop leaking because that's not helping us because it's not the actual story. Actually, this is really interesting because I, I mean, I, I respect and actually admire why you're saying that. And I think I understand why I'm privy to some information. You know, there is a risk, isn't there? And I don't think people understand this enough that we might compromise uh, technologies, capabilities that aren't otherwise known about by potential adversaries. Is that fair to say? Oh, absolutely. And it's not this, just that. It's we've looked at some of these things already and have you know different opinions than what was provided to the media um, from the person who leaked the data. So that's why I'm saying, um, you know, other than it being an, an, an like an unauthorized disclosure and an issue from that perspective, it is not the whole story and it's not always accurate. Um, so it's actually hurting us uh, versus helping us. Yeah. So let's talk about you, Sarah. I mean, I'm fascinated and I admire your courage in being prepared to talk about it because you actually copped a serve from uh, a certain person who shall be unnamed after you came public and talked about your mediumship role, the fact that you have alleged psychic abilities and that you use those psych psychic abilities as a separate day job, a separate job from your day job. What... Um, what can you tell me about how how early you realized you had those alleged gifts? Um, childhood. I started, I had encounters with uh, a loved one that had passed over, uh, that crossed over, geez. And uh, probably middle school, I started having encounters with spirit. And I didn't start having more psychic abilities until after I had a near-death experience in 2012. And yeah. after that, more things started happening. Um, but yeah, so kind of for a while, but I didn't really start learning. How, yeah, yeah, I don't even know how to approach it. Learning this journey, taking classes and training um, until about probably six years ago, five or six years ago, I forget now. Now, that's fascinating to me because I've spoken to a lot of people who are combat veterans, people who've been in very near-death experiences when there are people shooting at them, trying to kill them. And they describe how um, often they have an encounter or an engagement with the phenomenon for the very first time that literally scares the pajamas out of them. It's often not friendly. In your case, it seems to have been quite friendly, hasn't it? Can you tell me what happened? I mean, I, I don't want to distress you because I know it was a horrific period in your life, but 
how was it that you came, a beautiful young woman like yourself, how was it that you came close to death for heaven's sake? What happened? Uh, I had a routine sinus surgery. I had a bad deviated septum and uh, was getting a septoplasty done and surgery went well. Uh, recovery room did not. I first initially woke up and asked to go back to sleep. And uh, when I went back to sleep, I didn't wake up again. I heard the nurse say, oh my God, she's not breathing. And I was like, who's not breathing? That sucks. I pray that they're okay. And it was me. And next thing I know, I'm I'm not on earth anymore and um, with my family and loved ones. And uh, yeah, it was very unexpected. And um, I don't even know how soon after that was when I started having psychic things, probably within a couple of years. So I can't let this go by. You've actually died. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's it like? I'm alive because of, of an epinephrine shot, actually, and um, because God kicked me out of heaven. So <laughs> um, what's it like? It is the most, uh, if you can imagine, love and peace and those things completely surrounding you in a cloud or in a bubble. And it's that feeling that you're picturing right now, except uh, exponentially more. Um, it's incredible. And having my family there, I'm trying not to tear up. Um, it's the best feeling ever. I was home and, and my family was there to greet me. And then I heard a voice say, you got to go back. And I was like, go back where? This is great. I'm good. That place sucked. And yeah, I lost that argument. My family teamed up with the voice, with God, source, whoever you want to say it is. And uh, my family teamed up and I lost that argument. And they came back. <laughs> And so you're saying that as a result of that experience, something seems to have enhanced abilities that I think you believe you already had. Yeah, absolutely. I It seems like, I don't know if something maybe got turned on or what, but stuff, and it felt like it was always there, but I just, it was a little boost, a battery pack boost, and uh, and it started happening. So a lot of the people I've spoken to who are combat veterans, people who've been involved in killing themselves and, and, and basically people trying to kill them, they often have really frightening experiences. You know, they've had the kind of hitchhiker phenomenon where apparently malevolent anomalous phenomena appears to be engaging with them. That's quite threatening. Is that what happened to you? I didn't have any, well, um, I don't know. I don't know how far you want to get in down down this rabbit hole, but I've definitely I had some malevolent things. I'm going to go all the way. I'm very interested. <laughs> all very right. Interested. Everybody, <laughs> buckle up. Um, I have definitely had some malevolent uh, things happen to me, for sure. I have uh, encountered so many different things from, I call it earthbound spirits, uh, which are ghosts. Like, so if you, you see ghost hunting shows, it's typically earthbound spirits that, that they're they haven't crossed over to the other side. Um, even different alien races during some of my sessions, um, house clearings or uh, house clearing is when a medium, a Reiki master could even go in. It doesn't have to be a medium, um, but you kind of clear out somebody's house for them if they feel like there's a spirit there or maybe some really bad energy. So you go in and kind of clear it out and then bless it afterwards. Um, so I've I've encountered some malevolent things during pretty much all of the types of uh, spiritual work that I do, um, but I've encountered a lot of good and a lot of love. So I don't want to negate and, and say everything's bad, but um, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> want to get into specifics, but there's also something that's called residual energy. So that's kind of like an imprint. So um, think of uh, physics. You know, everything is energy. Everything is you know uh, you you can't. What is the first law of thermodynamics? You you can't uh, create or destroy energy and or a part of the first law. Um, so everything's energy, even the other side. So uh, a ghost or a soul that was here, that was alive, when it goes the other side, it's in another dimension where there's still energy, there's still electromagnetic field. And uh, so that if there's a traumatic experience that happened in a place, a uh, war, or you know, maybe uh, an, a murder, or a flood, 
and you know flash flood comes through so there's trauma there's an imprint that happens in the energy field and uh this residual energy is like a, a replay it's a movie reel like a just you know short reel that's on a loop and so sometimes the energy doesn't know that you're there but when like a person sensitive to it when i walk through it i'll absorb something and so i've 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 absorbed some very negative things as well before. So when you were a child, before you had this near-death experience, had you experienced any kind of anomalous phenomena? Um, when I was a kid, I thought I did, but now I know I was likely watching satellites fly over. Um, I never saw anything looking up in the sky. because I, I first fell in love with the stars when I was in third grade. One of my brothers got a satellite for Christmas and we took it out and we looked at the moon. I annoyed everybody with a million questions that no one had answers to. And that was, it was love at first sight. Um, so I've been looking up for a very long time and I grew up in rural Missouri on a farm. So we had clear skies all, all the nights that I wanted that didn't have clouds. And I never saw any object in the sky until last year. <laughs> So I was in North Carolina with my family and some friends and some strangers uh, at uh, Brown Mountain on uh, Linville Gorge in North Carolina. Um, and Brown, but just for the sake of our viewers who may not know Brown Mountain, it's quite a famous location for looking at anomalous lights, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, Brown Mountain lights. So that was the whole purpose. We were going UFO hunting. And uh, the group of us, I think there was maybe 10 or eight to 10 of us, I forget. And then there were some other you know, strangers on the overlook. So it was not a hike or anything. So there's a uh, you know, concrete path and stuff like that. So it's um, not, you're not out completely in the wilderness, but it's a beautiful, beautiful view if anybody ever gets a chance to go there. And one of the guys and I that I had just met, we were talking with a woman and we were facing, like I'm facing you right now. And so we were looking up and the light appeared and I kind of, kind of took my breath away. And I was like, that's an airplane. That's for sure. An airplane and discounted it and uh, went away. And then it came back and it was just a little bit higher than where it was before. And it kind of did a little bit of movement and just disappeared. And it happened so quickly. I couldn't even get my phone out. Like, so I totally understand when people are like, I didn't get a video because the video probably wouldn't have showed up anyway, because it was, you know, midnight or something. Um, yeah, it was pretty crazy. And I was looked at the dude and I'm like, did, did you just, and he was, and he had this beautiful soft voice and he was like, yeah, I don't want to ruin your experience. And I'm like, but you could ruin it. Was, was that what we saw? Like, go ahead and ruin it. <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> And so you're convinced it was something really anomalous? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it was really cool. And no one else saw it because all, all the other group, they were in a different spot and they were looking a different direction. So we were, we were the only two that saw it. Now, do you want to talk about the more recent anomalous objects that you've seen, I think, in, even in the privacy of your own home? Yeah. Um, I haven't told a ton of people this. Um I had, this was actually probably, um, I would say, I'm trying to think of what time frame it was. I know it was at least last summer or maybe before that. I woke, I so I do have vivid dreams and lucid dreams. And so sometimes I'm, I know dreams are happening and I'll let them play out or I'll control them or something like that. And so at one point, I don't know what time of the night it was because I never bothered to look at the clock. Um, but something woke me up because it was pacing in my bedroom. And as a medium, that happens. That is that is that is not um I'm gonna call it a rare occurrence now because I know how to protect myself and I know how to protect my house. Um, but it happens. And so I immediately thought, oh, this is a spirit, because sometimes I'll I'll see these things in between, like when you're starting to wake up and coming out of REM, I'll see them then. So when I actually open my eyes, they won't be there. And then I kick them out of my house. Um, so at this instance, I actually sat up in bed and it was still there. And I'm like, I'm still sleeping. And it was pacing in my house. And what, what did um, you see? Tell me what you saw. Um, it was, it looked like it was probably six and a half maybe to seven feet tall 
Nice. And it was dark. Uh, so it was hard to depict exactly what color it was, but it was looked like it was like a bluish purple skin. There were there was no hair on top of its head and it had some ridges on its side. There were no ears, uh, so it was really flat. And the nose kind of looked like a little bit more like Voldemort, but a, maybe a little bit more bump than Voldemort. And it had like a, I'll call it like a Star Trek type uniform on, um, very like straight, plain, very clean. I couldn't tell what color it was because it, it was dark, um, but so it was a darker color. And it had this sword. It looked like it was made of very um, beautiful crystals um like not crystals it wasn't plural it was like one object uh it looked like some from from a sci-fi movie um but it was like glowing and it was like kind of changing um sorry where was this sorry i didn't pick up where that was what was this crystal yeah it was, it was in um in my bedroom so the he was holding it he was holding oh, so, so he was uh, holding what a, a rod he or was a... holding the sword at his side so what do i have around here here's my phone so he was holding like if this is the 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 handle, he was holding it downward, like not in a threatening, like not attacking not in a threatening manner. Um, and he was pacing, um, not quite at the foot of my bed, but a little bit past it. And so I still was like, my, is this real? Like, this is totally real. And so I start and I look down and Krypton, my cat, he is my little protector. And, um, he was just sitting there watching it. So I've seen Krypton um, fight malevolent things for me, um, spiritual wise. And I have seen him growl and fight in the air. And he's also seen, I have a best friend that passed away. And so he visits. And so Krypton, like I've seen him react to good and bad energy. And he was just sitting there watching it just like I was. And so I was like, okay, yeah, I'm not getting bad feeling any either. So I started asking her questions. I'm like, can I help you? Do you need some water? Do you do you need a pillow? Do you do you do you need a blanket? Like, are you cold? I could turn up the air. I gotta walk by you though to get to the thermostat. So I'm asking all of these ridiculous questions just to try to get it to engage with me. And it it was like a guard at the London Palace was like face forward on a mission. And I just kept feeling like it was protecting me. Um, at one point there was kind of a glow and it looked like a portal. Um, it was like a, like a very, very light pinkish glow that appeared and he stopped or it stopped. I shouldn't say he, it stopped, looked in the, in the, like the portal thing and it lasted for not even two seconds and, and it went away and he kept on pacing. Oh, I got goosebumps. <laughs> Um, and I was like, okay, so now do you need water is like, should I be worried? And again, didn't do anything, just kept on pacing. And I'm like, and so Krypton at that point laid down to go back to sleep. Okay. If you're, if you're okay with this, I'm going to be okay with this. And so I went back to sleep. You're kidding. So come on, Sarah. I mean, I've got to say, if I, if I had a blue alien humanoid in my bedroom, I'd be yelling at it saying, get the hell out of here. I mean, um, I, <sighs> I mean, well, I'd be terrified. the life of a medium, though, like some of these things aren't that, you know, I, there's things that happen as a medium that you're, you know, a door might slam and you're like, okay, who wants my attention? And not right now. So what do you think was the purpose? If, if this actually happened, what do you think was the purpose of that visit? I'm intrigued also that the being yeah. was blue. I, I think it was protecting me. I was... Uh, I had I had already been I'm going to be in James Fox's film that is coming out hopefully soon. And I had already been filmed and was dealing with uh, some I don't know some confusing stuff at work relating to career choices and leaving the UAP field. And so I think it was it was just to show me that I'm protected from the other side that no matter what choice I make they're there for me. I have encountered uh, different alien races in some meditations and in some of my healing work. So to me, it was just another layer of, I, I got support. So obviously a lot, I suspect most of our viewers are sitting watching this going, oh my God, this is a member of the UAP task force who's actually 
talked to an alien, somebody who has engaged with a non-human being and believes passionately that they exist. In fact, you're more than belief. You, I suspect, would say you know they're real because you've seen it yeah. directly yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So just explain to me, I mean, you're a scientist, you're an astrophysicist by training, you're a trained intelligence analyst. You're not an idiot. You're trusted with top secret SCI compartmentalized material. Your government values you. Were they ever at all, when, you, when they became aware of your um, mediumship role, your psychic abilities, were they ever at all discouraging you? Was there any effort to try and discourage you from being open? H how does it feel in your office environment to speak candidly about the fact that you believe that you have these gifts? Mm -hmm. What's amazing to say is no one cares. I was terrified, well, petrified to let people know what I'm trying to have a business. I don't know what I'm doing and I have no idea what I'm doing with the website either. So when I first created my LLC, my name was out there. And so I eventually called it, I, I, I outed myself on Facebook and to all my friends, most of my friends I've known my whole life. It was no surprise to anybody. Everything made sense, but work doesn't care. Um, my friends that I had on Facebook at the time that I, that were coworkers, they were like, they would come to work like, oh my gosh, you could do this. You have to tell me stories. And like, everybody was actually really excited and, and asked me questions. And it's never come up of don't do this or like, you can't have this sap read on anymore. It's never, it, it I was terrified and it's just, it, I'm so proud to say that it doesn't matter. One of the things that always intrigued me, and I, I remember reading slide nine at the very beginning of my research when I was first looking at the UAP issue, and I became aware of this document that had been prepared by people inside the Pentagon who were briefing, I think, Thomas Modley, who was at the time an Undersecretary for Defense, on the phenomenon. And they were talking about how the phenomenon has the capability to psychically engage with human beings. And it struck me that one of the most recurring messages that I get from the many, many people that I speak to as I investigate and research this phenomenon is that there is an intrinsic connection between the phenomenon, what you and I might call flying saucers, flying disks, orbs, anomalous phenomena, and human consciousness, and possibly human psychic abilities. Do you agree? Oh, absolutely. Yep. Most of my communication that I have with spirit, when I say spirit, it's with that, that, that is a bucket of all the things of the other side. Um, when I communicate with them, it's usually telepathically or is through images. Um, so uh, let's say a loved one is trying to talk like a, I, I'm sitting with a client right now and I'll get an image of a sunflower. So it's like puzzle pieces. So everything does come in telepathically. So when I've heard stories of NHI and maybe even people speaking th through the aircraft, like they're looking, observing at the aircraft and they get messages there it totally didn't surprise me. And um, in dimensions that they operate in, you know, they understand physics and science way more than we do. Earth is pretty young compared to the age of the universe. So uh, they're way more advanced. So it makes sense that they understand different levels, different dimensions and can talk in different ways with us. So Sarah, explain this to me. The thing I wrestle with as a journalist, I'm an open person, a transparent person. I don't understand why, if there is a non-human intelligence, why doesn't it land on the White House lawn? Why doesn't it show itself more overtly to us? Wasn't there, wasn't there an occurrence decades ago at the White House? <laughs> um, I don't know. I think they know that maybe we're not ready. We'll probably, you know, we have too many movies saying if they do that, we're going to go to war. And, and, you know, I don't know. Um, do, 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 I, do you have any evidence from your time in the Pentagon 
that there might be some kind of non-intervention order, a prime directive, as Star Trek referred to it? Um, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I am at the Pentagon now, <laughs> but not for not for UAP stuff. Um, uh, no, I, I don't know that answer. I mean, I, I I can only speculate, but I mean, I'm I'm guess I'm hoping, you know, somebody like you, if I if I had the clearances that you've got, and I went into the Pentagon, I think we've all got this illusion, and I know it's completely deluded. I think we've all got this delusion that you can go into somewhere like the Pentagon, and whatever dark secrets there are, you can pry them out. You know, give us the reality, Sarah. Do you think you know? Uh, every, no. Do you think you know everything that's going on inside the Pentagon and inside the intelligence? No. I, I don't want to know. I don't know. Um, what I have learned through this journey, ignorance is bliss. And I there are some things that I really, I don't need to know. I'm good with that. Um, it's such a big building. I, I tell my mom and dad that it's like a city itself. There's a cleaners in there. There's all kinds of different restaurants. There's a CVS and or a pharmacy for, for those not in the U.S. I don't know what CVS is. Um, it's a city. It's huge. And I purposely once in a while will get, we'll just go walk and get lost just to try to find my way back to my office. Cause it's so big and I'm still learning how to navigate. And I've been there. I don't even know five, five or six months now. So give me your best guess. Give me your analysis based on your intuitive understanding that comes from your psychic abilities, but also from your insights that you've gained on the job. Explain what it is, the anomalous phenomenon that we're investigating. What, what is it? Is it alien? Is it ETs from another planet? Is it interdimensional? Is it God? Um, almost all the above. I... It's a good question. Um... My spiritual side is saying God is in all of us. And my spiritual side also says we are all technically parts of being aliens because we're made of the stars. So what you learned in Astronomy 101 is we're, we're star stuff and we're all made of stars. Um, what are they doing? It's I've joked with people over the years that I feel like Earth is is a little bit of a zoo. And they just come check on us to see, oh, you know, go over a nuclear site. Did they did they explode you, themselves yet? And and then pop in and out, go, you know, the uh, ocean's vast. So they're able to go maybe hide a little bit in the ocean when we are able to see them, like the few videos that we have. Um, I, I, oh, man, I don't know how crazy you want this to get. But spiritual side of things, um, I have heard lots of theories and one I do believe is Earth is young and we're kind of an experiment. So uh, some of the, the benevolent beings want to come here to make sure that we're OK. And maybe the, the bad guys like the, the malevolent entities aren't trying to take over. Um, so who are the good guys and who are the bad guys amongst the NHI? <laughs> yeah, um, I'll start with bad um, draconians, lizard people. A lot of people joke about lizards and basically all, all politicians are the lizards type thing. Um, but yeah, dra draconians. Um, so a lot of them are, are built or are named after a lot of constellations. Uh, so Arcturians are the good guys. I work with them a lot during some of my healing sessions. And well, I should say they work with me um, and let me know that they're here. They visit to try to make Earth a better place. And they know our human lives are kind of slow compared to some of what they could do, but they're here to help and to guide. Um, I, I I don't. Do you want to? Do you, how deep did you want to go? <laughs> well, I'm, I mean, I'm fa I'm fascinated. I mean, one of the things that. I've actually had people say to me, and I've got no evidence of this, and I'm just fascinated by it, is that there is a reptilian presence on this planet. And it's fascinating hearing you say that. Are, are, am I, are you able to tell me, did you see any evidence of beings in your work at the UAP task force? 
Uh, UAP task force, no. So that when I was on the task force, official duty on the task force, we kept it strictly to data. We did not talk about aliens at all. We didn't discuss conspiracy theories. We kept it strictly to data because uh, we were would, working forgive, on imagery from what I was doing. Forgive me for interrupting, but if, say, somebody had secured video of a biologic or an alien, wouldn't that be data? It would be. We never saw, I never saw that. I wish I would have. That would have been cool. But no, I, I, I only looked at aircraft. And so when you say that you didn't come across it during your time at the UAPTF, where, where have you become aware of the presence of what you say are reptilian beings? Mm -hmm. Oh, that was through my spiritual side, my spiritual work. And do you... um, I have, uh huh. And, so, and forgive me, sorry, I, I, I apologize for interrupting. When you talk about that, is that something that you volunteered to your colleagues at the UAPTF? Because I'm fascinated by yeah. the number of people in defense and intelligence who say to me privately that there is something to this non-human intelligence idea of different beings, blue beings, reptilians, Nordics, greys. And it does my head in because they're talking candidly about this as a reality and accepting it in quite a normal, casual way. And yet, to my worldview, we're the only intelligent beings that I know of at the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, yours is derived from a spiritual understanding. Uh, I'm intrigued because there's a lot of stories, a lot of legends, a lot of mythology and um, modern ufology, suggesting that there have been interactions between humans and different types of non-human intelligence. And have we? I mean, did you ever see any evidence in your time at the UAP task force, for example, that there were agreements between humans and non-human intelligences? Um, I never encountered it, but I know of stories of people uh, prior to me and prior programs that know of them. And it's interesting because one of the people I know you worked with was Jay Stratton. And poor Jay and his family, as you know, have had extraordinary experiences since he returned from Skinwalker Ranch with anomalous phenomena hounding uh, his family, often in quite an unpleasant way. Um, is this something that people on the UAP task force talked about? Is, you know, did people often have these kind of anomalous experiences? Lou Elizondo, for example, told me in an interview how he and his wife and family saw orbs, often at night, but also during the daytime in the back garden, some kind of intelligently guided orb that floated through their house and through their black garden. How many members of the UAP task force had what appears to be NHI clearly taking an interest in them um I don't, I don't want to speak for other people because that's that's their story and maybe they'll come out and talk but there were a few of us that have had personal encounters and some some a little bit more intense than others mine was good but i also am used to entities coming in my house and talking with me as a medium, but somebody, you know, you, like you said earlier, you wouldn't be okay with that. Uh, so I have a different mindset from when I have a visitor versus them. Cause I know what comes in my house is going to be of love and light because I put very strict boundaries and protection up. Um, but not everybody knows that, right. And not everybody knows how to do that protection. I, um, Yes, I'm trying to dance around answering your question. Yes, uh, there's others that have had personal encounters at some point in their life, maybe not necessarily when they were on the task force. One of the things that I've been researching very recently is people with psionic abilities that the US government, notably the US Air Force, has been taking a strong interest in. When your psychic abilities came to the attention of your managers in the Department of Defense, was there ever any attempt to recruit you into something like the Gateway Program to study your psychic abilities? Nope. <laughs> no one. It was never a conversation or, or anything like that. 
And when you were a child, um, some of the people that I've been talking to have gone through the gifted and talented education program in schools, and they found themselves diverted into programs that were run by a private military contractor overseen, we suspect, by the US Air Force, which appears to have been looking for children with alleged psionic abilities. Do you, did you ever in your time as a child have any kind of testing that made you wonder if you were being tested for your psychic ability? Oh, no. I, I grew up in rural Missouri. If somebody would have tested me, the whole town would have known within 2.5 seconds. Uh, it was no and then then you would have known the the strangers were in town and they talked to sarah and so no i'm thankful that that didn't happen one of the things you've talked about in the course of this conversation is you know we've talked about god we, we've talked about how you died and you feel like you went to heaven are you christian and do you think that those beliefs if you have them mold your perception of what you saw um, yes, I grew up in a religious household, and I, you know, my spiritual journey has taken me down a different route. So I don't consider myself religious anymore. I'm definitely still a Christian. I pray to God and I talk to God, and I just I talk to a few extra people now than I did before. Um, I, I think how my journey has happened has been at the. I mean, there there's a synchronicity to everything, right? Um, and I think it. It synchronized perfectly um, because if I would have done any of those orders in a different manner, I might have a different perspective for things. But I think because of my astronomy and the astrophysics background, it's also really opened, kept me open minded for all of this. Because even in undergrad, when I was a sophomore, somebody asked me, uh, you know, are we alone? And I'm like, why would we be selfish enough to think an infinite amount of space? It's just us. And then the next question was, but you believe in God. So how do you portray infinite amount of space? And I just, it was such a weird question to me. Cause I'm like, why are those two separate things? Why, why are it? It was just, it blew my mind that people put things in different buckets and uh, the world doesn't work like that. It's interesting, a few months ago, we had a conversation with Paul Thigpen, who's quite a prominent theologian, and we were talking about the ideas behind UAPs. And Paul was arguing fundamentally that they're not incompatible with Christian beliefs or, or any religious beliefs, that, that if you look at religion, if, you know, I, I made the observation that if you go back through religion, it's possible to see a lot of religious ideas through the notion that in fact what we regard as spiritual beings are in fact perhaps highly intelligent, super advanced technologies that were engaging with humans at a time when, you know, what was perhaps a, a spacecraft powered by anti-gravity drives was described as a winged chariot or a, a glowing sphere in the book of Ezekiel. What's your take on that? No, yeah, I totally agree. I so. I do connect to angels very, this is really hard for me to, I'm not used to just, you know, talking, you know, I call it with muggles about this. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, no, it's funny. I, I mean, my, I, it's funny. I, I have a daughter who's um, very similar to you in, in terms of your belief system. And she's constantly jolting my worldview and basically challenging me to be more open-minded. And, and one of the things that I find is the more I go down this rabbit hole, and, and infuriate the debunkers. I love it. You know, I get these rabid messages from debunkers who, who are attacking me for taking seriously things like psychic abilities, things like near-death experiences. And yet so many people are describing what you're describing. I mean, they can't all be deluded and wrong, can they? Right. Um I, I think the truth is is coming out, it's happening uh, in the spiritual community. You call it an awakening. And everybody, 100% of humans that are born, we can all do what, I'm, what I do when I talk to loved ones. Uh, we just lose the ability over time what, because why? we're told it's not real. We're told it's an imaginary friend or don't say that. This That's against God. And um, so we get it in our heads that it's not right and to not talk about it. But if you embrace it, 
it's actually brought me closer to God. It's brought, because I could see, it's, it's hard to explain because I get to see different things um, that others don't from a different perspective as well. So your physics is about reference points. If you are solving an equation, your reference point matters because if you change that, you're going to get a different answer. You're going to get a different outcome. And I get to see multiple reference points at one time and multiple outcomes. And it's such a gift that I hope to never take advantage of. Um, But I also get to see, you know, the bad as well that comes along with this and people are always going to believe what they want and that's fine. I'm, I'm not here to force somebody to believe everything that I'm saying, but I'm saying with confidence or else I wouldn't be here. I'm not getting paid. I'm, I'm not, you know, nobody's sitting on the other side of this laptop telling me what to say. I am doing it to, to try to help. Um, and try to educate. So the biggest thing is education and help the awakening. And kids now are starting to be embrace more of the unknown. And it is such a marvelous thing to witness. So I'm fascinated that you say that you were in contact or you actually saw this blue being, because one of the things that has really jolted my worldview, and I, you and I spoke about this privately, is that multiple people, an alarming number of people, have contacted me from all over the world since I started talking about a person who told me that they were being communicated with by a blue being. And I'm somewhat embarrassed and ashamed of myself to admit that initially I was scoffing at the idea and very, very dismissive that a non-human intelligence would reach out to an individual human and impinge on their consciousness and give them creative ideas or intellectual ideas. But that's exactly what people are describing to me is going on, that there is some kind of seeding happening, some kind of exchange of knowledge happening at the consciousness level. And it often involves beings or entities that when you really push people, I mean, it shocked me when you said earlier that the being you saw in your bedroom was blue, because that just brought back the familiar the familiar tones. All of the accounts that you give are so familiar to me. Is there a mission that you believe you've been imbued with? Have you been conveyed the notion that you have an obligation to make people more aware? Um, I don't think it's an obligation because we still have free will. I think it's... Um, I think it's time to wake more people up. Um, but but is, know, that something, when, is that something... Is that something that you've decided yourself or do you think you've been given a little nudge? Oh, I for sure have had a nudge. I've been having a nudge my whole life. Yeah. <laughs> all of all of this roller coaster of a journey has made sense. And the more spiritual classes I take or the certifications I get, it's just another layer of, ah, oh, this is why I'm here. This is this is why God kicked me out of heaven. Um, different things that I've been able to do at work of projects that I've worked on. And it's like, oh, okay, this is also why I was kicked out of heaven. So it's, um, I've definitely got a nudge and I definitely am brave enough. I have, I was raised to be a very strong, independent woman and can do a lot on my own and, and take a, take a lot of blows. And I have my whole life, I've spoken up for others as a group, as a whole, um, people have passed me words to speak for them. And I think now is just another layer of that. Can I ask you this? In closing, I think we're getting close to having to wrap soon, but I'm so enjoying this conversation. (laughs) One of the excuses that's often given to me privately by people of deep religious belief and deep religious conviction is that America particularly is a very religious place that most people believe in God. And the idea of an ontological shock that, that revealing the existence of a non-human intelligence would be of such a shock to the populace that it would cause widespread um, breakdown of society and um, you know a loss of the very structures of our democracy. What do you say to that kind of notion? I, I mean, I totally agree. I think that's why maybe some things haven't happened in mass yet because of it would cripple economy or cripple religion around the world, not just our country. Uh, it would, uh, it would hinder, you know, 
gas. Like if they gave us their technology, we don't need fossil fuels anymore. It would, it would impact every single thing in our lives. And uh, I'm excited for the day. I'm hopeful for the day if they want to show up, but I, I think they will do it in a, a baby step type manner. Um, I hope they do. Do you think yeah. we're ready? Um, will anyone ever be ready? I think that answer is probably no. So I I know there's a lot out there that are. I have been receiving messages and a lot of thing, uh, emails and stuff from people that have had encounters. There's a lot of people out there that definitely are that there would be a lot of support of. Um, so yeah, I, overall, yes, we're ready, but... Well, my analysis could never be scientific because I'm only as good as the people that contact me. But going on the people that contact me and the volume of people engaging with this subject, I get the impression that the phenomenon is showing itself far more overtly to people at the moment, that there is a very um, intense effort by whatever it is to make people aware of its existence. Do you think we're close to some kind of a, a disclosure moment? If not, I mean, I certainly doubt the Pentagon's ever going to stand up at a lectern and tell all, but do you think the NHI might be positioning themselves at some stage to reveal to us the manner of Oh, absolutely. I 100% confidence, yes. I do think NHI are ready to come forward. I think all of these, like what you said, they're, things are happening more frequently now, and... Um, I do think your disclosure is going to happen from the public, not from the government. Uh, the disclosure is going to happen and the government's going to have to backtrack and yeah, be open like, oh, yeah, how about that? <laughs> so why are they lying? Why not just tell the truth? Um, my personal Sarah opinion, this isn't anybody else's. I just think that, you know, at first they didn't know how to tell the public and so buried it and and that that mound of dirt that it was buried under has now become a mountain and maybe you don't know how to come back from that and also maybe things were forgotten over the years and you know people have passed away that had some legacy knowledge so that went with them because they never were able to write it down because it was classified and um so i think uh, it was a multitude of things um but again my personal opinion <laughs> So, Sarah, how can people contact you if they want to hear more from you and know more about your work? Mm -hmm. I am on Instagram, so Sarah Grace Warrior. And then, yeah, I think that you could Google my website. Um, that's on there, too. So email is sarahgracewarrior at gmail.com if you want to reach out there uh, on LinkedIn. I have had an influx of, of LinkedIn things, so I'm sorry. I don't get on there very much, <laughs> but... Um, yeah, I think mostly Instagram is probably the best way to, to message or email. Well, I, for one, take great heart from the fact that the Pentagon, which is commonly described and decried as this kind of monolith of denialism and cover-up, actually has somebody as open-minded and as spiritually interesting as you on their, on their staff. And uh, it, it makes me feel better for the sake of humanity that, that you're, you're in there with all the secrets in your head. Sarah Gam, thank you. thank you so much for speaking to Reality Check. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thanks for watching. Go to joinnn.com to find NewsNation on your television provider. And please don't forget to click that red subscribe button to ensure you get more of NewsNation's unbiased and fact-driven news coverage.